So I hope everyone can see my screen now. Uh, as Max said, my name is Christopher Seidel. I work for ARM in the tools department out of the Munich office, and I will <laughs> talk to you today about how to master DevOps and MLOps in embedded systems with some of the innovations that ARM has uh, brought forward. This is our agenda today. I will talk about how to improve the development flows for embedded and IoT. Uh, I will uh, dive a little deeper into uh, DevOps with cloud-based uh, continuous integration. So what, what is that actually? What are we talking about? I will also talk about MLOps development flows to, uh, that help you to implement <coughs> machine learning on edge devices, and I will give you some CI usage examples. Let's take a quick look at the hardware that is designed by ARM. Here are some of the key innovations that we deliver to the market to satisfy the growing needs of uh, the microcontroller market. In the early 2000s, we focused on enabling ultra low cost, low power and small area for tiny sensor devices, which uh, we provided with products such as the Cortex M3 or the M0 Plus. Later, we continued to drive the performance too. As security became increasingly critical in a more connected world, we invested heavily in ARM Trust Zone technology, which led to the introduction of the Cortex M33 in 2016 and delivered a step change in security. More recently, as the need for ML inference and DSP compute grew, we introduced ARM Helium technology. This makes it possible to deploy more compute intensive ML inference algorithms in endpoints without a dedicated uh, NPU, which we of course also have. Today, we extend those ML and DSP capabilities to the high efficiency space with the introduction of the Cortex M52. Here's a little bit different view to the processor portfolio with a focus on the instruction set. Uh, the main takeaway on this slide here is that the code that you wrote, for example, 14 years ago on the Cortex M4 is still binary compatible with the M85. If you don't play too much with the system registers, that is, and along with a future roadmap uh, using ARMv8M, for example. And if you have used SEMSYS DSP interfaces, it's even portable to devices such as the Cortex R82, <coughs> 82, excuse me, or the X3. So we care a lot about portability, which helps your profitability and the sustainability of your software R&D investments. And when we enhance our instruction set architecture, we focus on energy efficient compute, which we try to make as easy as possible. The next big thing, Edge AI, is going through a revolutionary change with the enablement of generative AI use cases such as on device live language translation. With a continuing advancement in the optimization of large AI models using quantization, pruning, and clustering techniques, we see the opportunities for small versions of generative AI LLMs and multimodal models to run at the edge on embedded systems. We've already seen developers in the ecosystem evaluating running generative AI models such as Llama on Raspberry Pi devices, for example. And the enablement of generative AI use cases at the edge is near and ARM is ready for it as we scale up to the highest performance IoT use cases using a mixture of our Cortex cores, Cortex M cores, um, enhanced with Helium uh, DSP extensions, and then also enhanced with uh, the Ethos U NPUs that we provide. <clears throat> Talking about Ethos U, um, at Embedded World this year, we have just released the Ethos uh, U85, which uh, uh, offers not just weight times matrix for convolutional uh, neural networks, but also matrix times matrix multiplication, which is an essential component for transformer networks. As transformer-based models can be adapted to different tasks more easily than CNNs, transformer networks will drive new applications. Transformers are especially valuable in vision and gener generative AI use cases for tasks such as understanding videos, filling in missing parts of images, or analyzing data from multiple cameras for image classification and object detection. The characteristics of transformer networks allow for more efficient hardware use, making it possible 
to deploy these models on edge devices with limited compute resources. By using a design optimized for transformer networks, developers can enable new possibilities for AI at the edge applications that require faster inference, optimized models for better performance, and improved scalability. As edge AI continues to scale, silicon vendors, embedded IoT developers are converging on ARM for simplified AI development. We are delivering the features and capabilities required in a modern development flow, enabling AI on a unified tool chain and single proven consistent architecture. Developers, data scientists, academia and others are all benefiting from the extensive knowledge base of our partners, the growing software tools ecosystem around ARM, as well as open source software libraries and AI frameworks. For example, it's great that the PyTorch Foundation is investing in enabling new runtimes such as ExecuTorch for the edge. Finally, OEMs and ODMs are then benefiting by being able to build, deploy across multiple hardware platforms, all based on ARM. So what do we need to improve the development flows for, for embedded and IoT? Um, one thing is we need a cloud storage service for our repository, so for the software that we're actually building. This repository hosting service typically includes access control and collaboration features for distributed teams. For your software development environment, instead of installing an IDE and other software tools on your local device, you can also set up uh, something with your cloud provider. For continuous testing, a server running in the cloud contains a tool environment with simulation models and settings specific to your project. When deploying software onto many devices, over the air, OTA programming offers methods to provision and update software of devices that are already in the field. And finally, once you have deployed in the field, use data analytics to monitor the devices to spot anomalies and collect training data for the next generation of your ML algorithms and models that can be then deployed to these IoT endpoints. How can we accomplish that? And this is some uh, something where ARM is, is really strong using software standards and standardized development tool platforms, which reduce overall product cost and improve quality. An IoT application usually sits on top of an RTOS, for example, RT thread, that is uh, using some kind of network connectivity talking to the cloud. And an ML model might help in doing a specific task. Using our PSA or Platform Security Architecture APIs, you can interface to into a secure firmware image that might hold the required access keys for the cloud, for example. Below that, you have a layer of abstraction for the hardware. Having development tools that understand this layered concept is using standardized interfaces is key to successfully generate an IoT application. And we'll come to that point later in the talk. Um, one thing to mention here down in the uh, right bottom, you see SEMSYS, which is our uh, um, common microcontroller software interface standard, a very long word um, that offers lots of building blocks to enable these applications and these layers and uh, contains lots of APIs that help you to um, communicate between these different building blocks. And I will talk about some of these components also during my talk. So let's dive into DevOps with cloud-based uh, continuous integration. Um, so what is test-driven development, DevOps and CI-CD? Uh, basically, test-driven development embraces that software requirements are converted to test cases even before the software is fully developed. DevOps is a, com a combination of software development, uh, the dev part of the word, and IT operations, the ops part. And uh, together, they help you to shorten system development by providing continuous integration, test, and delivery. Which brings me to the next topic, continuous integration and continuous delivery, so CI and CD, are used to integrate uh, incremental code changes of several developers into production code. CI CD helps you to run automated tests to verify functionality and takes care of deploying firmware images to test fleets. You can also use it for large scale delivery to many IoT endpoint devices. 
together these three enable an agile development workflow that helps you to produce better quality code in less time. So what times, types of software testing out there? We are talking about test-driven development, so we should understand what, what tests do we have here. And so um, I hope many of you remember the good old V model, uh, which basically shows these, these test types. So we have, for example, uh, unit testing, which tests just little chunks of code at a time. We have integration tests um, with, um, yeah, testing whether two components um, are uh, working together when they are combined, and it also verifies that the interface between them works properly. properly. Uh, system or, or black box testing tests that the final system works as expected, and this is usually achieved by sending external controls and stimuli to the system and measure their response. Regression testing, um, this is more this, this circle part here, is usually a suite of tests, unit and integration tests that run continuously upon version control updates. So once you commit new code into the repo, and this is used in continuous integration, so CI systems. Um, if we take a look at this uh, small image here, we see that setting up CI comes at a cost. So you have a, a steep learning curve, but in the end, the overall effort is definitely less than, than not using CI because uh, you have to Im Im implement um, test more code uh, in, in many different ways, test how this code is working together. And if you have set up a stable CI system, this really helps you with your testing efforts. So how do we envision this, this modern uh, embedded development workflow? And uh, the, the central point here is that you have a Git, most of the time Git uh, repository that is used as the source code management system for synchronization, storage, and version control. And with that, you can enable actually different use cases that help you shortening the development time. So for, for local development, uh, you have your develop, you are the developer or you have your <coughs> team of developers sitting in front of a computer. They, uh, you can use a classic embedded tool chain uh, or IDE such as Skyline MDK, which supports ARM virtual hardware. And we'll talk about that just in a minute. Uh, for MCU simulation, or you can also um, connect to directly attached hardware. So once you commit to the to the repo, then also the CI pipeline kicks in, and it 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 runs through the build, test, and uh, reporting steps that give you almost instant feedback on the quality of the code that you have committed. Of course, depending on how long your build takes and how many tests you have to run, but uh, it's automatically triggered once you uh, submit the code. And usually the tests um, in the cloud can be run on ARM virtual hardware, which is a which are our simulation models of the Cortex-M cores and uh, sometimes also extended to the platform. So also the Ethos NPU can be simulated. And this actually avoids, for example, um, having to take care of costly and error prone board farms, which we all know hardware tends to uh, to break, um, cables tend to loosen uh, and so on and so on. So it's, it's uh, having a simulation model that behaves just like the processor is a big pro here. And if they are your test results, if they show failures back in the code repo, you can then again go back to the to this little loop here and um, run the local development and you can co do complex debug on either a development board uh, that's off the shelf or on your final custom hardware. So this is uh, what we see as a modern development DevOps uh, development workflow. So what is this ARM virtual hardware that I was talking about? So as said, it's uh, precise simulation models of Cortex-M devices and subsystems uh, designed for complex software verification and testing. And we have uh, the, the cores themselves. We have the Ethos uh, U micro NPUs. We have peripherals, memory, uh, and then a debug interface. And with virtual I.O., you can stream in and out data. 
Uh, you can basically run any any code on these models, either it be a RTOS or bare metal code. And um, yeah, using the virtual I.O., you can um, stream in and out data, which then basically enables test automation of diverse software workloads, including unit integration uh, tests and, for example, fault injection. Uh, fault injection is also a very, very specific test that you cannot really run on, on real hardware in some cases. For example, motor control systems um, usually do not handle fault injection very well if the motor then goes rogue. So uh, it's really uh, it's really tough. And um, this ARM virtual hardware is available either locally on your PC uh, as an executable, but also as a cloud service that can be integrated in your DevOps and MLOps development flow. How does this help? Um, if we are take, uh, if we think how we go through the uh, development stages of of the embedded uh, project, uh, we can start now very very early because we don't even need access to any any hardware. So we can use a virtual layer with virtual drivers. So you can start testing your user application code uh, and how it works together with your IoT or ML software platform and um, do the first unit and integration tests and validation here. And you can, using uh, using the simulated IOs, you can via Python scripts uh, stream in and out data. And then when you, when you uh, go to the right-hand side here, uh, you simply rip out this virtual layer and uh, use a, a board layer for, a, for example, a development board that you got from your favorite DISTI or from your favorite trade show, or even today, Max said it before, you can uh, win a couple of development boards uh, during the day. Um, you just adapt to the drivers and uh, can then start also using um, real I.O. via test uh, equipment and check how the system behaves. And once you have your own custom hardware available, you get this, what I call here, target layer. Uh, again, with hardware drivers, maybe even other drivers for uh, other components that were not available on, on the development platform, and you can uh, run the whole tests test through. But at the same time, always, you have this really fast feedback loop using uh, the virtual hardware. And we have also a technology called um, the Samsys View, uh, which you can use to create event log files um, in your, with your software that can be written out at any stage, and you can even compare them between the different steps. So you can uh, check, okay, does the event log file for the virtual uh, simulation uh, looks like the event log file for the board or for the target layer? And this, of course, uh, all enhances the development cycle tremendously. So how can we achieve this development flow? And uh, in a joint effort with NXP and ST Microelectronics, we have specified a new way of creating projects across different tool chains. We call this the Samsys toolbox, again, Samsys here, and it consists of all the tools you need to work with uh, so-called Samsys packs. Uh, just one quick sentence about Samsys packs. Samsys packs is a way of delivering a device or board support or software components uh, to you as the end user. And uh, it's basically a zip file with all the required uh, source header files, uh, documentation, whatnot, and an XML based description of what is inside of this pack. And uh, so, for example, in Samsys toolbox, we have a, a tool called CPAC GET that helps you to download packs that you have not yet installed on your system. Um, and the main tool is C Solution, which manages the whole project and uh, helps to create complex solutions for your application. So overall, the Samsys toolbox uh, ensures reproducible builds uh, throughout the whole product lifecycle management. And uh, it's available as a set of command line tools. So you can run it um, just in a, in a command shell. Uh, you can run it then, of course, easily also uh, on servers. But we have also um, IDEs on top of it. So our own um, Kyle, uh, Kyle Studio works with it, Microvision, IAR, EWR. We have an Eclipse plugin. Um, ex extensions for VS Code, and of course, GitHub Actions, which we will talk about later. And uh, being a uh, yeah, latest and greatest, of course, it offers 
multi-compiler support, so for ARM compiler for embedded, uh, Clang, LLVM, GCC, and the IAR compiler, and it also uh, works on all major host operating systems. So this is an essential component provided um, by or in a collaborative way by ARM and the ecosystem um, that helps you to, to control all of this. And uh, another important uh, change that we have made in our latest uh, tools is how we deploy them to, uh, to the end uh, customer. And we are using what we call the, the ARM tools artifactory. And this is basically a, a server location where all the tools are available and you can download them, them very easily uh, using, uh, in our case, in our uh, Kyle Studio, we are using a tool from Microsoft called VC Package, which is a package manager that, again, runs on all major host operating systems, which is why this is the, the reason why we're using it. And it helps to download uh, these tools, install them locally, and then you can uh, use them uh, on your uh, system or in your yeah, CI CD uh, workflow. Uh, of course, you don't need to rely on VC package. So, uh, for example, in GitHub, we are using uh, wget or or curl or something like that to access the tools directly, download them and, and install them. And this um, ensures a consistent tool setup that can be reproduced in five years time when you need to fix a bug, for example, that you detected in the field. And um, on GitHub, we have this repository that shows how to use this in an MLOps environment uh, using Docker containers. Talking about uh, MLOps, so how can we deploy and maintain machine learning applications? Um, maybe just to set the scene, uh, AI on edge devices um, is a huge growth opportunity and it can and will be applied to lots of emerging markets such as devices for medical diagnosis, voice control devices, vision-based devices, and many more. Um, thus, we need a robust software development workflow to make sure that all these applications can be brought to life um, easily. So what does that mean, ML on edge devices? And, and this is basically a, a simple equation. It's, it's compute, so the computing power that you need. It's a set of libraries uh, that you can use in your uh, software. And then, of course, the uh, corresponding tools that you um, use during your workflow. And um, yeah, ARM supports these DSP or ML workflows with the Helium processor extensions and the EFASU NPUs. Uh, we also deliver libraries such as uh, SAMSYS DSP and SAMSYS NN, again the, the SAMSYS word, which can be targeted towards the best hardware platform, be it the processor or the MPU. So you can also scale uh, between different uh, use case scenarios. Maybe in one case uh, it's enough to run the NL algorithms on a processor. In another uh, scenario you would access the uh, micro NPU uh, to do that. And so with that approach, you can actually get an, an 22x uplift in performance when you compare pair it to a, a Cortex M4 uh, to a Cortex M55 with Ethos U55 in the Embassy uh, Audio Mark um, benchmark. So it's uh, this is it's it's really nice. You can target from the tiniest Cortex M up until uh, the biggest Cortex M with micro NPU, uh, you can target your software using these uh, libraries and tools, of course, then in different uh, uh, yeah, execution classes or uh, computing performance classes. Um, MLOps, um, again, ML, uh, machine learning and ops, the, the IT operations. So what is the, the typical life cycle here? And, and this, um, this graph, shows it. The, the machine learning models or algorithms are usually tested and developed in um, isolated experimental systems, so on, on larger machines, not on the uh, edge endpoint. And MLOps is the process between data scientists, DevOps, and machine learning engineers to transition uh, the ML model to uh, production systems. And it applies to the entire product lifecycle and is frequently an iterative process. That's why it's a, it's a wheel here. Um, 
because uh, usually if you if you get a a model and you deploy it then you collect new data uh, you analyze uh, the data you label that and then you retrain your model and get an even better model and many embedded systems introduce ml technology in an evolutionary process so you start with a classic decision algorithm for data collection and then you have model evaluation and system validation that requires that the ml model is executed with the final instruction set capabilities and this is again something that we can support with the arm uh, virtual hardware here and um, <laughs> This is a nice example of uh, an inference went wrong. Uh, so this, uh, I think everybody <laughs> agrees that this is uh, the image of a cat, but the inference had oh 50% chance that it's a bath towel, uh, towel or a paper towel. And uh, correct this, this means correct decisions can only be made in areas where the training data exist. So if you're that in in these areas or in these areas, then yeah, you, you don't know. And um, learning in the ML way means that uh, the algorithms are retrained based on new experience because you you fill up that hole. And for effective algorithm selection, training, and validation, uh, a large set of representative and qualified data is uh, the prerequisite. How do we help here? We have lots of uh, material for ML developers. Uh, the ML developers guide is for embedded developers that want to use ML, system architects that want to integrate a variety of tools and data scientists who work on the models. Uh, we have a GitHub repo available. This was the one that I was talking about earlier that contains foundational tool components uh, that can be used in the ML ops systems. And finally, we have the synchronous data streaming framework, which helps you to record any kind of uh, sensor data and play it back to your virtual hardware using your build tests. And uh, let me dive a little bit deeper into that one. So how does this work? Um, or again, setting the scene, one of the big problems is to record and replay the, the training data, especially when you want to reply, reply the, uh, replay the data on virtual hardware, you need means to record it first and then uniformly uh, play it back and for that we came up with SDS the synchronous data streaming framework and this allows you to record and play back real world data for analysis and development and you can use this data for example with filter designers uh, as an or use it as an input for your um, algorithm development so we have um, in the in the recording stage you, for example, want to record a gyros gyroscope and a microphone input, uh, which goes through uh, the MEM sensor interface or the audio interface. And at the same time, you are uh, yeah, recording these streams via the SDS recorder interfaces, and um, it can connect to various different channels. And then yeah, store the files, um, which then can be used for the uh, for training your ML model. And um, in the in the in the testing phase, so you have basically your your algorithm under development and your ML model. You can then use these data files to uh, stream them back into the virtual model via the virtual streaming interface or VSI. And then you have reproducible tests with always the same test data. And as I explained earlier, you can then, for example, use these event logs, log files to uh, check that the response from the system is as you expect it to be. Um, but this is not all. So uh, uh, developer enabled is, is crucial when we uh, are to see an increase in AI enabled IoT shipments. And so we have the cores, we have the micro MPUs, uh, we are delivering these features and capabilities. Um, but uh, of course, we also uh, need other stuff. And um, with the uh, with specialized tools, we have, uh, for example, the library, Samsys DSP and NN that I was talking about, but we also have Samsys Stream. And this is a set of, of, of tools that you can use to um, streamline such a, a processing pipeline. So usually in a in a micro speech example or something like that, you need a, a from the 
on the input, working on the input to do some signal conditioning, so filtering, sensor fusion, Kalman filters, then you do the feature extraction on the spectral data, and then you do the actual uh, ML uh, classification, and um, how, and these can have all different data bandwidths and data types and whatnot, and SAMHSA stream uh, helps you with that to, um, yeah, get to a solution faster. And we have teamed up with uh, Kikso, who are uh, now part of, of TDK, to test this whole flow. And uh, this is actually how, how they use it in, in their workflow. So they capture the data with SDS, and uh, then they import it to their MLOps um, platform. They do the model training uh, and model selection, and then they deploy it uh, either to uh, the model, either to ARM virtual hardware, or you can download the whole model and uh, test it on your target hardware. Um, coming close to the end of my presentation, I want to give you uh, some uh, CI usage examples here. So for example, verification of complex uh, applications. So imagine you want to create a smart speaker that has a digital microphone array for the commands issued by the user and an audio front end then uh, there's some traditional uh, signal processing to the task, and then you have the ML part. So this is the signal processing, and then you have the ML part to detect the keywords. And uh, using all the tools that I've shown you before, you can verify the correctness of your algorithms and also uh, compare different algorithms. Um, how we have this, this repo doing it, um, so another repository that you can test, it's a a TensorFlow microspeech example, and using the virtual streaming interface, you can stream pre-recorded data into the AVH and uh, thus test the behavior. The audio driver uh, supports multiple channels and data formats, and then the, the data is transferred block by block, and uh, you have a callback event uh, after each block, and so thus you can mimic the actual audio input into a real-life device. Take a look at the the repo that explains this in, in more detail. So let me come to my summary. Um, developing in a cloud native world, you have cloud native tools and services that help you to reduce time to market, improve code quality, and of course, uh, create new business cases. Um, maybe the, the biggest takeaway, don't be afraid of the cloud. Um, and don't assume that your IT is better than the one of big cloud service providers because it's not. So uh, I sometimes or the, the biggest pushback is always yeah, but then the, the, the data are somewhere else. But yeah, these big providers usually uh, know their stuff, and um, you seldomly or the the chance that uh, your company might be compromised because of some social engineering is I think higher. Um, you don't have to switch anything at once. The, the journey, starting the journey is key, so you can move uh, bits by bits. And um, ARM and our ecosystem is here to, to support you. Finally, where to go next? Um, here's a couple of links uh, to different uh, topics, different GitHub repos and documentations that uh, help you getting started. And with that, I think I'm almost in time and say uh, thank you for listening. Hey, Christopher, thank you so much. That was, uh, well, um, we do have a couple of questions. Okay. Th that was the first time I've heard uh, the term MLOps, and that makes uh, a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, because you've got DevOps, we're used to that, and now everything's yeah. going ML. Um, yeah, because so, it's it's very it's very related to this DevOps De DevOps thing. Yeah, it's just that the model always needs to be retrained, refined, resubmitted. So this is the the operational part of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I'm just blown away by how fa how fast the whole AI and ML. Uh, well, ML is a subset of AI. But how how fast that's exploded on the scene! Uh, I don't know if you remember in the 1990s, people were really enthusiastic about uh, expert systems, mm -hmm. and they started. But it was really just a decision tree, or well, sort of knowledge-based inferencing. 
and the marketing folks got their hands on it and started stamping AI inside on everything. Yeah. Uh, and it was very disappointing. And everyone, uh, for a long time, AI had a bad taste in everyone's mouth. <laughs> and I'd forgotten all about it. And then suddenly in the 2010s, it just came on the scene and now it's everywhere. Yes. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so, uh, someone says, can, "Will you share this documentation later?" Um, the the presentation, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I will share it with RT Thread, and then they can distribute it. Yes. Okay. Too many uh, links. I know you cannot <laughs> save all the links. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, somebody says. Uh, can you maintain your critical data inside the uh, your organization? So you're doing combining on-prem with cloud computing. In principle, of course, you can do that. I mean, I was talking a lot about cloud. You can also uh, switch cloud with on-prem servers. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. I, I mean, you don't have to go to GitHub or GitLab or whatever. Uh, big thing is out there. You can also set up your own Git instance on your local server and um, pull the tools um, from our artifactory and then run everything locally. So that is also possible, of course. Right. And then uh, we've got a question here. Are, are there any suggestions on a smooth migration uh, between local development, which is what a lot of people currently have, and moving mm -hmm. to cloud development? Um, he, the guy who posted this question has got concerns about the effort uh, required to define the I.O. behaviors for testing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I showed in this in this little graphic, of course. At the yeah, the setting the exactly, at the beginning. Yes, setting up the CI stuff is it is painful, yes, but in the end, it really, really pays off. And again, as I think I said in my last slide is you can also do bits by bits and not everything at once. So there are a couple of best practices to do that. And the other thing is like everything else, the first time I do anything, it takes a lot of time. But, but once you've done it once, then the next time, the, that big bump at the beginning gets yeah. lower and more to the left because exactly. you've already done it. You know what you're doing. Yeah, you can know you can often use stuff that you've done in the past, you know, to move forward. I, I'm just amazed by everything that Arm's doing. To be honest, I, well, I, I'm sure I predate you. I I was around before Arm was around when it was called Acorn Computers back in 1978. OK. And uh, you came up with what was called the BBC Micro, which was part of the BBC's BBC television in England, mm -hmm. their mission to teach people about computers. And I, I lusted after a BBC Micro. I was desperate to own one, but I couldn't afford it as a student. OK. Uh, and yeah, then suddenly, it's also much easier today. I mean, uh, I think the power of a BBC micro, the BBC micro bit or the micro bit, you know, which we released, yeah. I don't know, five, six years ago, yeah. has much more computing power than the BBC micro by the time. Well, the BBC micro was an 8 bit machine based yeah, on yeah. 6502 processor. Yeah. Um, so, how things have come along then, since then, it's the, 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 the smallest development board now. <laughs> has got more computing power than uh, we would have dreamt of back in the day. Exactly. OK, well, thank you so much. Um, oh, there's another question here. Do you oh. think that there will be special peripherals or coprocessors dedicated to AI microcontrollers? Well, yes. <laughs> we have them already. Yeah? The, yes, the, the micro already. NPUs uh, are yeah. these little coprocessors that you can use today. Uh, yeah, we have a NPU. Couple of MPU yeah. stands for Neural Processing Unit, like you've got Correct. GPU for Graphics Processing yes. Unit. MPU is Neural Processing Unit, yeah. and that's inside the, it's just another block inside the microcontroller. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, the, those are available today. The, the, the trick is learning how to program them. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, this is the nice thing about uh, our tools, that they help you doing the partitioning yeah so right. uh, the the libraries they run 
either on the core or the uh, micro MPU, so you can easily uh, move the stuff around and, and, and test how it behaves. Um, this is this is much easier than it was before. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's another question about where to find the slides, but I'm going to let the uh, yeah, RT yeah. Thread team answer that one. Correct, they, they will provide yeah. the slides. Okay, well, thank you so much, Christopher. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Max. Have a have a great rest of the day, and uh, yeah, hope is it, it's exciting. Uh, 